Mads Mikkelsen's Hannibal Lecter is an extraordinarily unique character and, I believe, one of the most fascinating to be featured on network television. Mads Mikkelsen's performance as Dr. Hannibal Lecter is utterly phenomenal, and the fact that it manages to stand out in a cast already shining with star power that bring nothing shy of their absolute best is astounding. Mads Mikkelsen's performance is captivating, perfectly blending a suave and sophisticated demeanor with a horrifyingly savage palette. But as good as Mads Mikkelsen's performance is, it's the writing that helps to elevate the character to the heights it manages to achieve. Great performances alone, while commendable, can't carry a story. An actor can bring with them the single best performance ever put to screen, but if the writing doesn't elevate the character, that performance will only serve to elevate the actor, not the production itself, let alone the character. Hannibal Lecter is a captivating character that brings forth a type of horror not commonly seen in fiction, and that's philosophical horror. Hannibal isn't just scary because he's a dangerous fighter that's hard to kill or because he eats people. What makes Dr. Lecter so scary is the way both he and the show push the audience to look at what he does from his lens, rather than just as an outsider. By doing this, we're able to understand how he's able to take Will Graham, our protagonist, and warp him into a completely different character. Anyone can, and most people will, be grossed out by cannibalism. It's not difficult to pull off. However, the various atrocities and taboos committed by Dr. Lecter are presented in a very unique and sparing light, with a great deal of the show's runtime being dedicated to showing the audience his ways of thinking and how the characters, most notably Will Graham, come to understand him. What's most impressive is that it manages to do this without coming off as preachy or ridiculous. Humanizing evil characters is not an easy thing to do and it requires a very particular method of presentation and especially calculated pacing in order to achieve. A hypothetical of a presentation that fails in this regard would be a story that chooses to focus too heavily at the start on a horrible act committed by a character, only to spend the rest of the story assuring you that they're actually just a good person that's just misunderstood. The problem with this form of presentation is that it underestimates the values of first impressions and basically assumes the audience are gullible dimwits that can be too easily manipulated. It's critical of any writer to respect the intelligence of their audience. In Hannibal, the writers aren't asking the audience for their sympathy, they're asking the audience for their empathy. They're fully aware that they can't just present a monster of a person that does what Hannibal does right off the bat and ask the audience to settle on some insane attempts at justification. To try this would be ridiculous and unintentionally hilarious. Instead, the writers opt to play off the dramatic irony of people knowing about Hannibal Lecter and allow the audience to actually get to know him before they see him doing what he does, all the while witnessing how it is he manipulates Will into seeing the world from his own perspective. They're not humanizing Hannibal, but they're making sure you understand him, which is where the philosophical horror comes into play. At the start of the show, Will Graham is mostly of sound mind and would undoubtedly consider Dr. Lecter an evil person if he knew what the audience knows. But over the course of the series, Hannibal manipulates Will in hopes that Will's unique mental state, possessing pure empathy, can grow to understand and accept Hannibal for who he is. While Hannibal the character is manipulating the protagonist to understand him, Hannibal the show is manipulating the audience to do the very same. This method of presentation is prevalent throughout the entirety of the show as well. The bodies of the dead are often composed in a very abstract method that doesn't make the audience clench their knuckles so much as raise an eyebrow and scratch their chin. The human totem pole, the woman strung on antlers, the angel wings, they're definitely gross, but it doesn't feel excessive or gratuitous. One of the best and most intense scenes of the entire show has a drugged up man cutting his own face apart and feeding it to dogs, at one point cutting his own nose off and eating it for himself. The violence is presented in a very uncomfortable manner with some of the most intense music I think I've ever heard in a production. However, the show is careful not to go too over the top with it. The lighting of the scene obscures a number of the details and the camera rarely focuses on the man's face, thus ensuring that the audience isn't blind to what's going on narratively. In many ways, it's reflective of how Hannibal himself is trying to manipulate Will by forcing him to look at things in a different way, so that Will can eventually understand him. This is also a man considered by even Hannibal to be a disgusting, awful human being, and in general is so easy to hate even after this scene, further graying what would seem to be a very dark moment of the show. The point of the show isn't to sympathize with Hannibal Lecter, it's to empathize with him, much in the same way Will Graham has to. 
The show isn't telling us what to feel. It's telling us to look at things and understand them as they are. Much like when eating a meal, we must consume a thing to know a thing. It's one thing to witness evil, but to understand evil requires one to gaze into the abyss. And it's within that abyss which so apathetically gazes right back that one might find their own potential for evil. Do any of those meals look delicious? Do you believe Mason and Cordell got what they deserved? Did you ever see Jack Crawford as an obstacle to Hannibal rather than the other way around? Did part of you hope that Hannibal survived his plunge off the cliff? If we create mercy, does that mean we create murder? When the wall of morality collapses, do the taboos remain taboo, or has your certainty become uncertain? Throughout the series runtime, many parallels are drawn between Hannibal and various mythological figures. These visuals and metaphors range from likening him to the devil, Vishnu and the Wendigo, to comparing his personal philosophies and behavior with those of the Christian god. The range of these parallels invites the viewer to reconsider traditional views on spirituality, which in many ways are directly connected to the beliefs and values held dear by many people. These parallels between Hannibal and various mythical figures simultaneously help to bolster the moments where Hannibal's portrayed in either favorable or sinister lights, allowing the audience who has empathized with him to develop a more natural kind of sympathy that many other stories would fail to achieve. One of the show's greatest strengths is the balancing of how it portrays its characters, Hannibal especially included. While the show is generally neutral in its presentation of characters, the writers do a great job at finding points in which to portray them in more, and sometimes less, sympathetic lights. There are times where Hannibal is shown to be unmistakably evil, selfish, and in direct opposition of the protagonist, and there are others where he is shown to be genuinely kind to others, and even in positions of vulnerability comparable to Christ of Nazareth. The points in which the series steps into either of these contrasting directions are chosen very meticulously and sparingly, allowing the impact of the scene to hit as hard as it needs to for the audience, thus allowing the sympathy they may or may not feel to develop naturally. Hannibal being likened to God and the Devil is, to me, an especially fascinating way of illustrating his character. To many, the idea of God and Lucifer is as simple as good versus evil, however a closer examination of the Bible and other texts pertaining to the Judeo-Christian mythos, such as Paradise Lost, Dante's Inferno, the non-canonical Gospels, and many more, show that many acts of God are quite morally repugnant, and the devil is often depicted as more of a silver-tongued adversary than a violent warmongering sadist. Both of these selected attributes, the moral repugnancy and silver tongue, can easily be applied to Hannibal. At the start of the show, despite the dramatic irony of the audience knowing about Hannibal's tendencies, much of what Hannibal does is never shown and the characters themselves are very easily convinced that he's a kind-hearted and good man, much the same way those not privy to what God does in the Bible are likely to believe that God is a figure of absolute purity and undying love. But upon witnessing Hannibal's evil firsthand, the characters begin to liken him to the devil himself, effectively illustrating how insignificant classic ideas of good and evil truly are. And then there's the Stagman, a projection of Hannibal from Will's psyche. The Stagman's design is deliberately reminiscent of the Wendigo from Native American mythology. For those who don't know, the legend of the Wendigo stems from Algonquin stories about men who would transform into monsters after consuming human flesh. The creature maintains a humanoid figure but is quite malformed, typically with elongated limbs as well as a very slender physique resembling a starved person. According to the legend, the creature represented an imbalance of the soul, a horrific manifestation of the dangers of allowing one's soul to stray too far from good. I doubt any of you are struggling to see how this might pertain to Hannibal Lecter. However, there is one very interesting thing to consider when it comes to the Stagman. Ultimately, the Stagman is a projection of Will's psyche stemming from his understanding of the Chesapeake Ripper, which he eventually would discover was in fact Hannibal all along. The Stagman and what it represents, imbalance of the soul, malformation of humanity, and the evil man is capable of, all of this is Will's perception and understanding, which is in constant question as he changes throughout the show. It's not an objective measure of Hannibal as a person, because no such thing truly exists within the world that this story is taking place in. Of course, in the real world, the vast majority of rational and sane people would concur with the notion that Hannibal is a truly evil person, or at least that's what our understandings of morality and decency would tell us. Within the context of the show, there is a constant blurring of the line between good and evil, and the exploration into what makes the mind is made all the more compelling by doing this. 
When it comes to Hannibal, traditional views on morality are frequently used to convey the evolved complexity of good and evil in the modern world. The exchange between Will and Hannibal in the penultimate episode of Season 2 conveys this very point with particular poignance. Hannibal asks Will if they should show Mason Verger mercy or murder him. Will responds that there is no mercy, that we make it with what is essentially our superego, the Freudian concept of the part of our brain that gives us a sense of morality. Hannibal then responds saying that we create murder too, using the very same faculties that allow us to create mercy. Much in the same way Hannibal the show blends metaphors of God and the devil, the character Hannibal Lecter has now blended the very understanding of what it means to murder with what it means not to murder. By doing this, Hannibal has undermined the very causation of what enables us to do what we would perceive as good deeds or immoral acts. With neither spiritual nor mental justification for good and evil, or the perceptions thereof, Hannibal effectively nullifies the need to justify what he does. All of this is critical to understanding Hannibal as a character and how he seems to view the world. Let's take a moment to step into Will Graham's shoes and gaze into the abyss that is the mind of Hannibal Lecter. As far as profiling goes, Hannibal fits the definition of a psychopath to a T. He's impulsive, lacks any empathy towards others, has no reasonable long-term aspirations, and his view of himself is, let's just say a little bloated. I think in Hannibal's conversation with Abel Gideon, the two sum up Hannibal's perspective perfectly. In one particular conversation, Gideon points out that cannibalism was a baser instinct of our ancestors that we essentially outgrew, no doubt juxtaposing it with Hannibal's very high society persona. Hannibal's response is a snarky dig claiming that it's only cannibalism if we are equals. Now let me follow up that statement with a question. Is there anyone in the show that Hannibal is unwilling to, or at the very least is implied to be unwilling to eat? Some of you might think to yourselves, oh well, Will Graham, obviously, because he loves Will, or at least he claims to. But unfortunately for Will, even he's not safe from Hannibal, as is made abundantly clear in Season 3 when Hannibal attempts to Ray Liotta the poor guy. He would have succeeded too if it weren't for those meddling vergers and their dumb pigs. Besides Will, I think it's safe to say the only people Hannibal ever truly loved were Abigail Hobbs, Hannibal's surrogate daughter, and his sister, Misha Lecter, whom Hannibal likens to Abigail in a familial respect. However, in the finale of Mizumono, Hannibal kills Abigail in cold blood. He does this in response to Will having betrayed him. So Hannibal is willing to kill another person that he claims to consider family just to spite someone else that he claims to consider family. Not only does this speak volumes about his impulsivity, but it just goes to show that nobody is safe when they are around Hannibal Lecter. No one is his equal. But then there's Hannibal's sister, Misha, and this is where his views on cannibalism are made a bit more ambiguous. Hannibal claims to have loved his sister and saw her as a person for him to protect, so it could be argued that alone establishes that he sees her as lesser than himself, however I think there's a bit more to consider. Hannibal didn't kill his sister, she died of unknown causes. It's heavily implied that she was murdered, however that's ultimately left unexplored. Chio believes that the man in the cage is responsible for killing and eating Misha, however Hannibal tells her that although that man may have killed Misha, implying even Hannibal isn't certain of this, it was Hannibal who ate her. Hannibal's feasting on his sister is commonly interpreted by fans of the show as being a way to honor her, which would inherently mean that making her a part of himself is uplifting her in some way. I like this interpretation, but I'd also like to provide an alternative. I think Hannibal consumed Misha so that, in his mind, she would always remain with him and as a part of him. Sure, food is digested and eventually expelled, but like I said earlier, to consume a thing is to know a thing and to know a thing is to trust a thing. And Hannibal's willingness to consume people he has claimed to love likely implies that he sees it as some way to connect with them more indefinitely. After all, the parts of food that aren't expelled become part of a process that allows the body to continue onwards. Perhaps to Hannibal, consuming a loved one means he trusts them to support him, or at the very least that he wants to trust them to support him. Ultimately, it's left to interpretation. But of course, not everyone Hannibal consumes can be considered a loved one. In fact, the great majority of the people he consumes are ultimately inconsequential to him, much the same way a lion is indifferent towards its prey. 
There's a certain subtle transition in Hannibal's mannerisms and gaze when it comes to dealing with people he intends to kill. He'll continue to talk to them as if having an everyday conversation, sometimes with a smirk, all the while determining the most efficient method of disposal and carrying it out with exceptional skill. When Hannibal captured Abel Gideon, he always made it a point to bring Gideon to the very dinner table that Hannibal intended to feast on him, sharing the spoils with Gideon as if it were his own last supper. Hannibal Lecter never once shows an ounce of regret, compassion, or any form of hesitation, regardless of his love, hatred, or even indifference towards a person, because nobody is equal to him. At worst, killing someone he loves is like putting down a pet, but even that would be a generous guess. And it's this complete lack of regard towards others that makes Hannibal so terrifying. No matter what you do, if there is even a moment that Hannibal's narcissistic, petty, and impulsive mind sees you as an obstacle, he will consider you for his next feast, and there's likely nothing that you can do about it. Combine this with how effectively he undermines the general perception of morality, and it's terrifying just how inconsequential and insignificant that it can make a person feel. Helplessness alone is terrifying, but the idea that it doesn't even matter is a level of horror all its own. I stated in the intro that Hannibal's characterization is exceptionally well done, and that the primary reason for this is how the show wants the audience to get to know him, rather than overtly trying to build sympathy for him. This allows the audience taste or distaste for the character to grow naturally, while also showing a respect to the audience to put things together themselves and make up their own conclusions. But what specifically does the show do to familiarize us with this handsome devil? This is where Will Graham comes into play. As a refresher, Will Graham suffers from a condition of pure empathy, where he quite literally cannot control his empathy. From the start of the show, all of the killings are connected in some way to Hannibal, who also spends a great deal of time getting to know Will, both professionally and personally. Due to Will's ignorance of who Hannibal truly is, Will confides to him as a patient. At the start of the show, Will is brought in by Jack Crawford to help solve the case of the Chesapeake Ripper. It's an ongoing investigation that's uncovered multiple horrific deaths, so it makes sense that the man leading the investigation would start to seek an unconventional approach. At first, Will's involvement is relatively minimal. However, as time goes on and they get closer and closer to solving the case, Jack is unwilling to let Will go, and it causes Will an insurmountable mental stress becoming too familiar with how these killers think and behave. Most notably the Chesapeake Ripper, whom the investigator is unaware is Hannibal Lecter. With the combination of the investigations and their therapy sessions, Will is drowning in a non-stop barrage of empathy for Hannibal Lecter without even realizing it. What's truly terrifying to consider is that this kind of manipulation doesn't even require a mind like Will's. Anyone in Will's shoes would undoubtedly be manipulated by Hannibal, having to not only deal with him in their personal lives, but also in their professional as well. We know this because several other characters in the show who don't possess a mind like Will's are easily manipulated by Hannibal Lecter, especially as they get to know him. Will Graham can't help himself. By the time Will has caught on that Dr. Lecter is responsible for so many of the show's events, he's hell-bent on catching him, at multiple points just outright trying to kill him. But eventually, something changes within Will. His empathy has caused a fundamental change to his thinking. Will can't help but understand Hannibal due to his extreme empathy. Will even begins to take on various characteristics of Hannibal Lecter due to this, constantly nudging Will into a world of isolation and loneliness. Hannibal feels nobody understands him, meaning Will slowly begins to feel the same way about himself. Hannibal feels the only person who can understand him is the one person capable of thinking like him, meaning that when Will starts thinking like Hannibal because of his empathetic mind, he begins to feel that the only person who can understand him is the one who thinks most like him. It's a brutal downward spiral that Will had no chance of escaping the moment he was caught in it. By following Will in his journey, the audience discovers just how easy it is to fall victim to one's capacity for evil. At the start of the show, Will kills a criminal threatening to murder their own child. Will admits that despite the trauma, it did feel good to kill the man. It shows how even an act that is considered morally in the right can lead down a horrific road with just the right amount of influence and reasoning. It isn't hard to understand how Will would feel good after killing Garrett Jacob Hobbs. 
especially later on after forming a fatherly relationship with Abigail. But by the end of the series, Will has transitioned from arguably just an ultimately defensive killing to downright brutally murdering people in the same manners that Hannibal Lecter does. Even though the people Will kills are generally horrible, awful criminals, it's the means of and motivations for these kills that reflect the change happening within Will. By the time Will would have realized he's gone too far, he's too far gone. By allowing Hannibal to manipulate Will into becoming the monster that he is simply by means of understanding, the audience is left in a fundamentally awkward position. There still seems to be an inkling of the person Will used to be, but at a point it becomes clear that Will is no longer that person at a fundamental level, and that he has been changed forever. So, what is the audience left to do but continue and see what will happen? Sound familiar? Or perhaps you've come to care too much for Hannibal and Will, and would like to see them get some kind of happy ending, despite the impossibility of such a thing. If that were the case, even if it was just a thought that crossed your mind, then perhaps you too have been successfully manipulated by Dr. Lecter. And if that were true, what would it say about your capacity for evil? Hannibal is a terrifying series. Sure, the brutal violence and the suspense help to establish genuine terror, but at its core, I think what makes the show so especially terrifying is how it manages to show the evil one is capable of and explore what ideas of good and evil mean to individuals. I don't think it'd be a stretch to say that Hannibal is one of the most impressive shows ever produced when it comes to writing. I'm on my third rewatch of the series at the moment, and I still can't help but be impressed with how tightly knit the writing and character work is for this show. If you still haven't seen Hannibal, do yourself a favor and get started on that right now. The last four episodes of season two especially are some of the best hours of television I have ever digested. Those episodes are genuinely breathtaking with how good they are. But I'll hold off on gushing for the moment and leave it at this. If you want a show that combines compelling character work with suspense that makes you grit your teeth, this is the show for you. And I can assure you, it's a meal that never gets cold.